Okay, everybody, welcome to our advanced uh, nutrition workshop. Um, first of all, this is a brand new lecture. So I only ran through the slides the first time yesterday, and it took me a full two hours to do it. So I hope you all ate before you came in here, because yeah, we're going to be here for a while. Honestly, we'll get through this hopefully fairly quickly, but um, it is a lot of information. Typically, I try to keep nutrition very simple, and I'm totally changing my philosophy on this one, and I hope it works out well. Uh, if not, we'll never do it again. So, uh, The idea behind this lecture, though, is if you follow what I teach you, you're going to, one, get better chiropractic results. And for me, that's very important. I want you to get the best results possible. You feel good, I look good, and I think that's a good combo. The other, um, I like to do nutrition talks in general, just because nutrition can be a very frustrating topic. You can talk to 10 different uh, experts on nutrition. You can read 10 different expert books on nutrition and get 10 different directions on what is best for you. And I don't really have all the answers. I don't have the best direction, but what I'm going to teach you tonight are a couple of principles. And if you understand the principles and the physiology of nutrition, then you can tailor it to your needs. And that's the idea. I want to empower you with this education rather than give you meal plans give you some knowledge, and then you can run with what works best for you, okay? So this is our advanced nutrition workshop, and really it's just a, a couple of principles. And the first one, if you've ever seen me do a nutrition talk before, I always teach this first principle, which is H equals N over C. And anybody who's ever been to this lecture before, what does the H stand for? Do you remember? Health. It stands for health, yeah. And the C stands for calories. And calories get a lot of attention, especially in, in the United States. We love our calories. We consume a lot of calories. It's estimated that we actually consume four times the amount of calories that our ancestors did. But here's the kicker. We move three times less. Huh. So all this excess of calories and the, the answer to this excess is, well, you got to stop eating calories. There are so many of them. You got to cut that in half. Well, if somebody tries to cut them in half, they don't usually succeed very well. We call this caloric restriction. Anybody heard of a caloric restriction diet? Yeah, basically it's, it, the success is based on your will. And will does not last very long, does it, when it comes to nutrition. So if you're eating a full pizza and that's 2,000 calories and your, your nutritionist says you need to eat 1,000 calories and you eat half the pizza, well that might last a day or two, but soon enough you go back to eating the full pizza. So the answer is not in caloric restriction, what we're going to learn tonight. And we're, not, we're going to learn tonight that counting calories isn't that, good of a, or that useful of a, a thing anyway. But one of the answers is focusing on the N, which is the nourishment, your nutrients, right? So nutrients are the type of thing that, first of all, we're trying to get as much nutrient-dense foods so when I typically do this lecture, I'll do it in a corporate setting where all I do is teach this principle to a group of people who are all eating sandwiches for lunch. And the idea is we look at a sandwich and we break it down where the nutrients are coming from in that sandwich. And let's say this sandwich has bread. Let's say it has turkey and cheese and uh, lettuce and mayonnaise. <laughs> I'm a mayonnaise guy, sorry. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit. And actually, we're going to learn tonight that the right type and at the right time, mayonnaise can not be not such a bad thing. So uh, hold on to that thought. So this is our old food pyramid here. And I think we have to look at a little bit of our history. Most of us know that this is not such a good thing, but maybe we don't know why yet, but we're, we, we think this is not such a good thing. And it's because of nutrient density. So when you eat you eat for nutrients. It has a direct correlation to your health. In other words, you eat for nutrients so that you can live. So you eat to live. This food pyramid is designed for us to actually live to eat. And I'm gonna show you why that happens, but let's look at a sandwich. It's got bread. Here's our nutrient density line. Where does bread show up on our nutrient density line? We have whole grains here, 20. But let's be honest, they just sprinkle whole grains on the top, right? What are we really eating? Refined grains, right? Where is that on the nutrient density? Not very high. So what does that mean? It means you're eating a lot of calories, you're getting no nutrition. So what happens an hour after you eat the bread? You're hungry again. And so America has become a feeding lot. The way that we make cows fat is we first mess with their hormones, but then we fill them full of grains, right? So, okay, in this sandwich, well, 
maybe we're getting all of our nu nutrition from the meat or the dairy. Where is the meat and dairy up here? We have meats, yeah, red meats. It's all down here though, right? So, and we've all heard the commercials from the 80s, milk does a body good, that type of thing. They don't say that anymore. They say instead, got milk. Because it's actually unethical, it's unethical to say that milk builds strong bones because the research proves that it's not true anymore. The countries consuming the most dairy actually have the highest rates of osteoporosis. So it's really important to understand where are we getting our nutrients? It's got to be the mayonnaise, right? <laughs> Wait, what is mayonnaise? Uh, egg and oil. Yes, eggs and oil, refined oil, hydrogenated oil. Where is that? <laughs> yeah. So refined oils fall under a classification called anti-nutrients. Anti-nutrients mean when you consume them, they actually cost you more energy than they provide, which means when you're digesting, let's say it takes 10 units of energy to absorb or digest and absorb the mayonnaise, but it, but it only provides you with five units of energy. So you're, you're in the red. Does that make sense? Yeah. In other words, if you're on a deserted island and all you have is mayonnaise and Skittles, <laughs> if you were to eat the mayonnaise and Skittles, you'd die faster. So all the nutrient value is actually coming from the raw leafy green vegetables, 100. And then also notice the solid green vegetables. So I think here, for me at least, I think a lot of romaine lettuce. Here I think a lot of broccoli. That, those are my go-to. And the, the rule, the action step is a pound of leafy green vegetables a day or combined with a dense uh, green. And the trick here is you got to eat it first because if you start with the bad first, you're not going to have room for this stuff. And there's, a couple, there's, another re there's many reasons why you got to eat it first, but the idea is always get this first because this is why you eat. Everything else is dessert or for energy, which we're going to get into. So that's the action step, and that's what, that used to be my nutrition talk. Essentially, I went through it really quick, and I would say, just go eat a pound of vegetables. It'll change the world. And I believed that all through my 20s and my early 30s. Well, here I am now, and I've realized you can't just eat a bunch of vegetables and exercise and you be at your peak and so I learned the hard way and not being at my optimal I could feel it in my performance as a chiropractor in my sleep my energy levels the last couple of years I've come across something that has really helped me substantially and I wanted to share that with you and it took me a full year to finally put this together because it is a lot of information um, really boiled down by a couple concepts called macronutrient ratio Macronutrient ratio, essentially, instead of looking at the nutrients, phytonutrients, antioxidants, enzymes, minerals, stuff like that, we're simply going to play with our carbohydrate, protein, and fat intake. And this is where it gets kind of fun. So first of all, when I look at a weight loss, pro or when I look at a, a, a nutrition program, I, ca I, ca I classify a good nutrition program by, by addressing all three of these categories. One, not weight loss, but your ideal weight right? For some that's weight loss, for some that's weight gain, but your ideal weight. Two, health, disease prevention, performance, all those I classify basically health and performance or disease. Which way is your, bless you, that's dangerous, you got to let it go. Um, you, uh, one is pushing you towards performance and health and one is pushing you towards sickness and disease. And the last one is anti-aging and yes, the way that you eat is actually affecting the rate at which you age. So this is really cool stuff. So obviously, I don't know. I'm thinking her priority might be weight loss. Uh, caloric restrictive diets, those are based on your will. Those are tough. And medication, not so ideal for a truly healthy option, right? So what do we do? Well, first of all, I want to share with you the hormone factor. This is a really cool thing because what I said about calories is true. It's not how much calories you eat. It's how you stimulate your hormones. Remember that because... We could be the same size, but the way we stimulate our hormones might be totally different. So Keswick and Powen, these guys came across, uh, bless you, and they came across, they did this study where they compared, first of all, it was a caloric restrictive diet. So what that means is they took a group of people that require 2,000 calories and they only gave them 1,500, which theoretically you're going to lose weight, right? One group had 90% carbohydrates, one group had 90% protein, one group had 90% fat. And here's the results. When you are on a caloric restrictive diet of 90% carbohydrates, you lose a quarter of a pound a day. A quarter pound. Pretty good, right? If you're on protein 90%, you lose um, six-tenths of a pound a day. 
So you double that. And when you consume 90% fat, here's the thing that kind of blows people away, you lose almost a pound a day. Crazy, right? Why is that? I thought fat means fat. Fat means fat. Whoops. Sorry. I'm getting excited here. Yes. So, well, it's the way it stimulates your hormones. So, first of all, where did all the, 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 the carb diets? There's only two forms of energy that your body can use. It's glucose from carbohydrates or it's ketones from fat. Right? And probably none of us here have heard of ketones before. But we've all heard of glucose. We've all heard of sugar, right? So we have to look at the history of where all this stuff came from. Back in the 1950s, Eisenhower almost died of a heart attack. Okay, I wasn't there, but I heard it was a pretty big deal, and people started look, really looking into uh, how nutrition affected your health. Up until then, doctors thought there was zero correlation. Sadly, there are still some doctors who feel that way, despite the evidence. But um, they came up with a study. As they're starting to do all these autopsies, they see these, these people who died of heart attacks, and their arteries are chock full of fat. Fat, right? So the theory was, well, gosh, we eat fat. So if we're eating fat, that must go, bless you, that must be going into our arteries and killing us. Pretty rudimentary hypothesis, but it kind of made sense. So this, this guy, Anvil Keys, comes along, and uh, he takes a look. He does a study, an analysis of nine countries. And out of the seven countries, he actually found a correlation of high-fat diets with higher heart disease rates. So what he failed to uh, put in his his report was the, the two that he left out, France and Switzerland, have really high fat diets, but really low rates of heart disease. But it wasn't congruent with his hypothesis. Uh -oh. So he just did what most scientists do, and they just kind of say, we don't need that. Doesn't mean, but that was the very first research that came out that said, you know what? Nutrition has something to do with your health. Even though it was doctored, <laughs> at least it got people thinking about nutrition and their health. But, but it got them thinking wrong. They said, well, fat must be bad for us. So on came the onslaught of low-fat diets and a lot of products, low-fat. Instead of saturated fat products, we had hydrogenated oil products, right? What's saturated fat? Butter. What's hydrogenated oil? What's, does anybody what? Margarine, right? Processed stuff, yeah. So why are carbs a problem? Well, first of all, we learned that <laughs> <laughs> um, it leads to some issues of weight gain. So for decades, from the 50s to the 90s, America has just been getting bigger and bigger, fatter and fatter, more and more heart disease and heart attack. So obviously something is wrong. We're not doing something right. Well, <sighs> the anti-fat led to excess carbs. Remember, there's only two forms of fuel. If we're not eating fat, we had to get it from somewhere else. We had to get it from carbs. So as we got fatter, then what happened, the 90s came along. So we started messing with our metabolism a little bit. Not our hormones, but our metabolism. And we discovered, and I think I might have told some of you this story. I had a friend in high school, this was the 90s, who he was the center of our football team, freshman and sophomore year. So by senior year, he went on a diet, and he looked fantastic. He, he was, totally changed his body. And I was like, what would you do? And he said, oh, well, I learned how to stimulate my metabolism. What I do is I eat seven meals a day. I spread them out. I eat right when I wake up. I eat a donut. And then I stopped listening because he's like, first of all, remember, I have three criteria for good nutrition. The right weight and prevents disease and anti-aging. Eating donuts is scientifically proven to not prevent disease, right? We know that. That's, that's pretty obvious. Yeah, they might improve some quality of life to some extent. But, so, but what happened was it actually works. When we use our digestive system all day, it's like leaving the air conditioning on in our house. It's just burning energy all day. So because we're eating this fuel, carbohydrate, which understand something you need to know about carbohydrate. Did I already pass that? Carbs are the preferred fuel source over fat. So in terms of fat storage, anytime there's a presence of carbs, your body is going to just take that fat that you've eaten, put it right in those spots that we can't get rid of it, right? Because it's the preferred source, not because it's the better source, but because it's preferred. So think of it as like newspaper. It burns very easily. Fat doesn't burn so easily, okay? If you're doing fat-burning workouts, you're not burning fat, 
And they say, oh, do this workout, you'll burn fat. No, it doesn't work that way. In the presence of carbs, your body does not burn fat, it stores it, okay? So it, then it gets stored to all those fun places, right? Plus, carbs are, so carbs are highly addicting. And we've all been there, like, if you eat a French fry, which is a high glycemic vegetable, it's really hard to stop eating those French fries, at least for me. And once I get going, it's, it's hard to stop. It's like, it stimulates a part of your brain similar to the way that nicotine and alcohol and heroin stimulate the dopamine centers of your brain. And it's unsatiating because what it does is it makes you, again, stimulate your brain. It has no, uh, um, typically a lot of high carbohydrate foods also don't typically have a lot of nourishment as well. So, by the way, to some of you, this might be seem, seem, seem like it's totally coming out of left field and new to you. Just keep an open mind for a little bit longer, please. So, and here's another uh, important thing. This graph right here, I got from a paleo book. I'm not about to in, endorse the paleo diet today, so don't freak out. But this was a great graph because it, it, it actually showed the correlation. The single most important predictor for weight gain is how many carbs you eat in a day. The number, not how many calories, how many carbs you eat in a day, and I'll explain why in a second. But look, 50, 50 carbs or less, 100 carbs or less, 150, most people are way up here. This is America, not this is America, right here. And carbs, those are carbs? Yeah, the, sorry, grams of carbs per day. Here's burning fat. Remember, if you're up here in carbs and you're doing a cool fat burning workout, you're not burning fat. Maybe a, little, maybe a percentage, but you're not really burning fat. Okay, so. <clears throat> That was weight loss. Carbohydrates fall short. We're, um, how about performance? And by the way, carbs take the longest, and then it just sets the stage for everything really, really easily. First of all, your body can only actually contain about 2,000 calories of glycogen or sugar that rests in your liver and your muscles at any time. So if you're running marathons and you're burning carbohydrates or newspaper to fuel that run, you're literally gonna eat something during that run. You see how they break out those gels and they eat those gels? Because they bonk, they run out of energy, they don't have enough calories to actually burn and they can't switch over to fat because those enzymatic, those physiological pathways don't work very well. Um, it also stimulates insulin like crazy. So this is where we get into the hormones. You eat carbohydrate, it spikes insulin levels. Now, at first that's not a big deal, but you do that every day, three times a day, and all of a sudden that hormone, that messenger, becomes less effective, which leads to something called, and this might sound familiar, insulin resistance, right? Insulin resistance then leads to type two diabetes, right? So insulin resistance is kind of like when your kids are doing something they shouldn't be and you say, hey kids, stop doing that. And they're like, okay dad, I'll stop doing that. And then they're doing it again and you're like, hey kids, stop doing that but they don't listen so well the second time. You gotta scream a little louder, right? So, not that we scream at our kids, I'm just giving you an, an example. <laughs> so, insulin, and we'll come back to insulin, but glucose in the blood also leads to advanced glycation end products. What the heck is that, ages? Uh, that leads to inflammation. Advanced glycation end products are essentially when a glucose uh, molecule mixes with a protein molecule, and now it renders that protein somewhat useless and that creates inflammation. So remember, one of the goals too in this lecture is actually to reduce pain. How do we do that? We reduce inflammation. And we're consuming glucose. You ever, like if I eat cake, if I eat cake, the next day my hands are like kind of stiff. You ever experience that? There's inflammation in the joints from all the, the carbohydrate, the refined uh, sugar. So the anti-aging component, insulin is also a mitogenic hormone which encourages cell proliferation. So mitogenic means essentially you have a cell that can divide into another cell or two cells. But one cell is genetically only able to do that so many times in a lifetime, it might be over a period of 100 years, right? But if you're constantly spiking insulin, what that actually leads to is more rapid cell turnover, which then leads to a shorter lifespan. Does that make sense? Okay, and uh, these there's something else I wanted to say about those ages. Let me see if I can think about that. Okay, so just to help you remember the ages, you've all heard of oxidation, what happens to um, metal when it's exposed to oxygen? It rusts. Or an apple, once you eat it and you leave it out, it turns brown. That's oxidation. 
And when the, the human body is exposed to free radicals, we oxidize, so we age, we get inflammation. And do you know how we, we defeat that? Anybody? Antioxidants. Antioxidants. Nice, right? There's no anti-glycation products. That doesn't exist. And it's incredibly hard for your body to get rid of these things. So you can't overcompensate on the blueberries if you're overdoing the carbs. So, okay, anti-aging, no bueno. <laughs> anti-aging, not so good. Uh, energy source burns like newspaper. A real dirty fuel that creates inflammation and um, <clears throat> leads to insulin resistance, all these problems, right? So let's switch to protein. <laughs> and so when I was young, I thought, if I eat a bunch of protein, I'm going to look like this guy, right? Well, if we're trying to minimize carbohydrate, the answer for protein is we're trying to right-size protein. There is a right size. So this is a really important formula, and listen to this. First of all, if you overconsume um, protein, your body goes through a process of gluconeogenesis. It's very good at reusing amino acids, proteins, for rebuilding structures. So you don't need a lot of protein, believe it or not. When you overconsume protein, the excess protein goes through, through this process back in the Krebs cycle called uh, gluconeogenesis, essentially turning that protein back into, wait for it, Fat? sugar, oh. glucose. And so all those processes that we talked about, the ages, the insulin resistance, all that, the inflammation, you're doing that in a high protein diet. And people are trying not to eat the carbs, they're trying not to eat the bread, and they're overeating the meat. It's not working. And it's creating other health problems because it's stimulate, stimulating the, the, um, the hormone that protein stimulates is mTOR. And mTOR is another cell, it's another anabolic hormone which leads to cell proliferation, which is important if you're a fetus in mom's tummy growing or you're a baby growing up into adulthood, and it's also important to adults for the development of cancer. So vegetarians for years have been saying, don't eat meat, because it will cause certain types of cancer, right? Well, that's not true. But an excess of protein in the absence of vegetables will lead to certain types of cancer. <clears throat> right size of the action step for protein. Action step for carb, minimize. Action step for protein, normalize. The formula for it, um, is right here. Basically what this is, is uh, these are in grams. 0.8 grams if you're, you know, you don't do much, you're not active, you're not an athlete. Um, 1.7 if you're an athlete, grams per kilogram. What the heck is a kilogram? It's like 2.2 pounds. So, and it's of lean body mass, lean body mass. So if you're 175 or 165 and you're 10% uh, fat, your lean body mass is 150. You divide that by 2.2, so we're at like 70, 70 grams, um, 70 kilograms, and we're supposed to eat, let's just say, let's make it easy, one gram per, per 70 kilograms. You're supposed to eat 70 grams of protein a day. 70. Did you see how I came up with that? No. No, okay, <laughs> sorry. This is how many grams of protein? This is per kilogram of body weight. Lean body mass. I don't have my phone, but we'll come back to that. So good sources of protein. 100 calories of broccoli versus 100 calories of, of beef. Which one has more protein? What do you think? Beef. The broccoli. 100 cal but 100 calories of broccoli looks like this, right? Oh. <laughs> 100 calories of beef. Oh. So this is one of my main sources of protein, broccoli, believe it or not. Um, these are the meats that, so I eat a lot of grass-fed beef, and we'll get into the grass-fed thing. It's, it's, it's important. Some people like, think it's not a, a big deal. It is. Uh, fish and lamb. My wife doesn't like lamb. We don't eat any lamb, but based on the research, lamb looks like a pretty good type of meat to eat. You're not going to see any lean meats up here, um, and that's because, remember, if we're not getting a lot of carbohydrates, we need another source of fuel. What's that other source of fuel? Fat. Yeah. So I put down here to give you an example. Six ounces of steak and a cup of broccoli is 54 grams. For some people in here, that's your entire day's worth of protein. Can you see that? Yeah, okay. Crazy, right? And you go to a restaurant and you order the chicken or the steak and they give you like 10 ounces and you didn't know that was enough for like three people, right? I'm going to save you money. So let's switch gears to fat then. In, is that you? Yeah. 
I wish. Um, <clears throat> in the absence of sugar, you burn fat. Fat is like a slow burning log. It burns all day. You get more energy from fat. Um, but it doesn't burn like a slow burning log. It actually burns much cleaner, like natural gas. Uh, it doesn't create the ages. It doesn't spike your insulin. So we're getting a smoother cleaning fuel, a smoother clean burning fuel. How does your body do it? Well, it doesn't happen overnight actually. To actually get these enzymatic pathways to work, it actually could take your body anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple months before you even start burning fat. And people are telling me I do a workout that gets me to burn fat. Uh-uh. It takes time. How does it do it? Well, your body takes the fat through a process of lipolysis in the liver. It breaks up the triglycerides of the fat, turns them into ketones. The one I want you to remember is called beta-hydroxybutyrate. Just remember the butyrate part. Okay, remember that. So all the things, the bad things about carbs, pretty much the opposite of fat. That's the, the, the overview of fat. However, the type of fat that you eat is critical. So I didn't just give you free reign on fat. We gotta understand what's good. Trans fats, all those things that we started inventing like french fries. Oh, pretzels, that broke my heart. That was, I'm in I was in chiropractic school when I learned that. I was so bummed, I'm like, no Doritos for me. Pretzels, I'm a health nut. It's like, no. <coughs> Uh, trans fats, so the margarine, stuff like that. Yeah, there should be 0% of that. That fat is useless and toxic. Saturated fat, beautiful source of energy. A quarter of your fat intake should be saturated fat. Unsaturated fat, this is where people really mess it up, right here. First of all, monounsaturated fat is a great, your best source of fuel. It should, it should be uh, over 50% over 50 of the, the intake. And I'll explain these in a second. Polyunsaturated fats, this is where people really mess up. When I was younger in my health class, we learned that PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, were good for us. But come to find out, PUFAs, omega, broken down into omega-6s and omega-3s, by the way, we probably all already know this, which one's good for us and which one's not so good? Omega-3 is the good and omega-6 is not so good, right? We need them both, but it's kind of like the HDL and LDL for cholesterol, right? LDL is supposed to be bad, HDL is good. Well, omega-3s are the ones that are anti-inflammatory. But most of the foods people are eating with polyunsaturated fats, which we'll show you uh, examples in a second, have, are loaded with omega-6, very pro-inflammatory. So carbohydrate, high carbohydrate diet, inflammation. High PUFA diet, more inflammation. More pain, more disease. So here's your options. We've got grass-fed butter. Here's why the grass-fed is important. I'm going to get into that because some of you just think I'm, you know, just a, a health nut and a hippie or whatever. But the grass-fed is important because the omega-3 fats, they come in short chain and long chain. The long chain, you might have heard of if you've supplemented with fish oil, like EPA and DHA, those are the fats that make up your brain and nervous system. Very important to developing baby, very important to a mom who's trying to prevent depression after uh, giving birth. Um, very important to your nervous system, right? Well, we could get, we could get omega-3s from like nuts and stuff. Um, we could get it from like flax seeds. The problem is we only get short chain fatty acids and we cannot convert the short to long. And if we can, it's like 1%. It's terrible, right? So people, another, another problem I have with, with vegetarianism is that you're not getting good source of long chain essential fatty acids, okay? I'm not anti-vegetarians, I eat them every day, but the idea is they're not so good for you in terms of building a healthy nervous system. That was a joke, guys, come on. Need to okay, so here's your saturated fats. Grass-fed uh, uh, cows, they convert short chain omega 3s from grass and turn it into long chain. Pretty cool. But if they're fed grain and chock full of steroids, you're getting nothing. None of those good, healthy sources of fat, right? If you're Irish, that's, that's right, the Irish. Gotta love them. Uh, saturated fat, coconut oil. These things are loaded, loaded with, this might be a buzzword now, you might have heard of this MCT, medium, triglyc or medium chain triglyceride fats. Okay, these things burn like rocket fuel. They'll bypass your digestive system, go straight into your lymphatics, and provide you with energy. And it was very convenient when all of a sudden saturated fat was bad for us and we could no longer get the expensive coconut from the South Pacific. We relied on the super cheap uh, soybeans that were um, grown right here in America. It was cheaper, 
And all of a sudden, it's loaded with PUFAs, which are apparently healthier for us because saturated fat's bad for us. It clogs our arteries, right? Um, cheese, uh, grass-fed cheese, a good source of fat, but also a good source of protein. So just be careful you don't overdo the protein. Like if you're having a cheeseburger, right, that's a burger plus the cheese, that's, it adds up quick. Um, all, here's all your omega-9s or your monounsaturated fats. So the majority of your calorie intake right here. Olives, olive oil, avocado, and uh, nuts in general are not very good because they're loaded with PUFAs, but macadamia nuts are loaded with saturated fat. They are the, the, the queen nuts. These things are awesome. So macadamia nuts is like the go-to. <laughs> no, I think that's the nut that they come in. <laughs> yeah, when avocados, it wasn't the grass-fed beef that was killing the budget. You remember when avocados like tripled in price a couple months ago? That was killing the budget because I eat like two avocados a day. So uh, here's all your PUFAs, uh, basically vegetable oils and most nuts. When I was in chiropractic school, we were actually taught to tell our vegetarian patients to eat a lot of walnuts because they had omega-3s in them. Two problems with that. One, what's one problem? We already said it. The short chain does not convert to long chain. And also, you might be getting this many omega-3s, but you actually get this many omega-6s with it. And so if the ratio is off, that's what leads to the inflammation. You have so many omega-6s. So you're like, but I'm getting all these omega-3s. Yeah, but, right? So the only way that we're going to get our long chain essential fatty acids, omega-3s, are from our grass-fed cows and our wild-caught salmon. Or just they have to be fed their normal diet is what they have to be fed. They can't be fed grains. But remember, we only need like two or three ounces at dinner. You could get a whole salmon for the whole family and, and what used to only feed you. But the key is how you lay out that platter. You've got to surround that protein with good, healthy sources of fat. So I thought this was kind of funny. I turned vegetables into bacon. What's your superpower? <laughs> I'm, I'm constantly amazed by this God-given innate intelligence we have in our bodies. Um, there are people who eat Twinkies or you know, donuts, and somehow the body takes whatever little nourishment is in that Twinkie and can still turn those nutrients into an eyeball cell. That's pretty amazing, right? The scientists are patting their backs when they duplicate a cell in the lab. I'm like, that's pretty sweet, but take a Twinkie and turn it into an eyeball. I don't think so, <laughs> right? Um, first of all, I only eat two meals a day because fat burns like a slow-burning log. You don't really need to consume it all the time. It keeps you full because true satiety actually comes from fat, uh, and it keeps it burning slow throughout the day. So my smoothie, which used to be like, like, I don't know, pomegranate juice, because pomegranate was all the rave back when I was in chiropractic school, and a bunch of fruit and stuff like that, and banana. Oh my gosh, that thing was like just chock full of sugar. Now it looks totally different. I use coconut milk because it has zero protein and sugar and a great source of fat. I use almond butter to mix in for taste, but it's also the lowest, um, the PUFA containing uh, and sugar containing type of butter. Uh, I use an avocado, and my secret weapon, chia seeds. Chia seeds are loaded with soluble fiber, which is kind of hard to get in your diet if you don't consume, if you're more consuming fat. But if you can't do that, because it doesn't taste that good to you, add a date. And dates have 50 grams of carbs, refined sugar actually, in just one date. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot, but it tastes really good. So 50 grams in one date? Yeah, pretty gnarly. So. Yeah, yeah. I should have put an example of what the carton looks like because I get the one that I get. You, if you look, at, start looking at it. Just start looking at the macros. Look at protein, fat, and carbs, and you'll see. There's a band that I think it's called Pacific something, and it's a little more expensive, but it's the one that has like zero uh, protein and zero uh, sugar. So and it's organic and all that stuff. So. Um, no, I buy it. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what my breakfast or here's what my breakfast looks like. First of all, I don't eat breakfast till 11 o'clock and I'll explain why in a sec. But 
I always typically have eggs. Eggs are like God's multivitamin. They're loaded with, packed with nourishment. And it's a good source of protein. I'll eat three eggs. It gives me about 25 grams of uh, protein. And then I just surround it with fat. Kalamata olives are my go-to. I'll eat like a whole avocado with that. <clears throat> I might put some feta cheese on that, which uh, tastes really good. Um, and that, that combined with this, and uh, I, I'm good till you know, I did that at 11 and I'll go home and eat dinner after this. And my dinner will look something like this. First of all, my opinion of a salad has totally changed. It used to be the most colorful salads, like a ton of lettuce with, with like um, beets and like tomatoes and um, carrots, like all these high glycemic type of um, uh, vegetables, right? And now it looks totally different. Still a ton of romaine lettuce, um, but I might put, yeah, a little bacon in there. Um, feta cheese, avocado for sure, avocado for sure. And uh, yeah, basically a wedge, but with, yeah. with avocado. Uh -huh. Why bacon? Because it's a, it's a really good sort. It's a real fatty meat, which will help, will fill you. I love bacon. Yeah. <laughs> it, but bacon is, there's, there's some toxin issues with bacon, even the cleanest, freshest bacon you can get. So you don't want to eat a lot of it. But bacon, I mean, if you have bacon and eggs, it, it fills you up way better than, than eggs and turkey, mm -hmm. right? They're, you're not getting any fat. So here's what my, here's a, a I just grabbed a quick example of the, the dinner here. Um, what I do is I take grass-fed beef, it's your least expensive type of, uh, of um, grass-fed meat, and take about a quarter pound. So a quarter pound will give you like 25 grams of, uh, of protein. And then I load it with, you guessed it, avocado. Uh, in there I'll grill up some uh, mushrooms and onions, uh, maybe a tomato. And then I put a bunch of romaine lettuce and then I'll put my, one of my secret weapons, which is, um, it is a, a pufa, but it tastes so good. And it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, maybe you've heard of it. It's, it's a soy product, um, and it's like a chipotle mayonnaise. Chipotle mayonnaise. I totally forgot to put a picture of it in here. But don't freak out. Like, put a tablespoon of it. But you know how I would, like, spread it all thin, thinking it was bad for me? But if your body is burning this fat readily, then it doesn't get... And I promise you, you when, when you become, you start burning this fat, you start losing 10 pounds in a week. No problem. No problem. One of the reasons for that, though, is your body does lose a little bit of water and a little bit of minerals. So it's important. And we'll get into a supplement that I, I think is important for you to take as well. So remember, just to go over it real quick, when you do this, you keep yourself under 50 grams of carbs in a day. You're going to lose a ton of weight. You're going to have a ton of energy. And you could eat like 4,000 calories. And you're still losing weight. And you feel awesome. Never feeling bloated. Always feeling uh, not full, but having good satiety. Uh, 100, I keep it around 100 to 150, honestly. And then uh, up here, just get out of here. You're, you're aging too fast. The diseases are building. It's not worth it. So macronutrient ratio, the majority is fat. The minority is carbs. Protein is right size with that formula. Okay, just real quick tip here. I, I taught you the macronutrient principle. I want to show you this intermittent fasting. People hear the word fasting and they freak out. Don't freak out. We're not going to starve you. I promise you, you're going to feel <laughs> full and healthier and full of energy than you ever have. What you do here is, um, well, before I do, I just want to reiterate this. This is what I was saying. Play with this. Count your carbs and you can play with it and find out what works best for you. Right? Just remember these numbers. 50, massive weight loss. 100, you're still losing weight, but you're in the uh, slow and steady. 100 to 150 is typically keeping you know, what we call your health, what weight is right for you, right? So what does 50 grams of carbohydrates look like? Well, one date is 50. One date is 50? Yeah, yeah. So, and I'm, and I'm not going to leave you hanging on that. Remember, I'm going to leave you some tools, and then you can go have fun with it and educate yourself. So the intermittent fasting, remember, the idea is with fat, you don't have to eat so much because the fuel, the fuel works so well. So we create a smaller window of eating, and we do that for a major reason. One, you're not using that digestive system all the time. Your body can focus on other things. How about like detoxing your body? Okay, next month we're doing a detox lecture. It's going to be an awesome lecture. It's if you want to take it to that next level type of thing. Uh, it also stimulates the mitochondria. 
These are your energy powerhouses of your body. So you're actually going to have a ton of energy. And what I do is I don't eat, like I said, till 11. And then I eat dinner. I try to get it done by 7 so that my window of eating in a day is only 8 hours. If you're doing that like 7 meals a day, your window is going to be like uh, 14 hours. And your body's never going to get a chance to detox. It's never going to get a chance to um, uh, 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 heal as well as it could. And it's always inflamed because it's always uh, loaded with sugar and stuff like that. So the way that I cheat this, so I kind of came across, I came across this right when I started transitioning into burning fat instead of carbohydrate. Bulletproof coffee, anybody heard of it? No? Really? Okay. So bulletproof coffee, you take a high quality coffee. I don't drink coffee or I, I, I didn't, and now I have for the past about year and a half. It made me anxious, it made me feel terrible. Um, I couldn't sleep at night, even if I had it for breakfast. I, it's just, I couldn't think, all the bad stuff, right? Well, I come to find out through my research that most coffee is really uh, toxic with mold. Ooh, yeah, yeah, and, and the, the more um, convenient it is, like the instant stuff, the more toxic with mold, right? And that's the stuff that is actually affecting your nervous system because, and that's what I read, and so I implemented it. And there's the two brands that I recommend, Bulletproof or Kamano, gosh, you can't even see that, Kamano Island, Kamano Island. You spelled it. <laughs> C-A-M-A-N-O. So you take a good quality coffee, right? Low toxic, it's organic, low mold toxin. It's um, dry, dry farm raised or whatever. It's high altitude. It's, you know, the places where you're least likely to be exposed to mold toxin. You mix it with a tablespoon of grass-fed butter and coconut oil. And what this does is, like, it, it, it hardly stimulates your digestive system, so your body stays fasting. So it can continue to detox your body, and you continue to have energy. How much uh, coconut oil? His tablespoon. Always put a, maybe a little bit more butter than the, than the coconut oil. This for the MCTs, medium chain triglycerides. This for the butyrate, the butyric acid, which translates to beta hydroxybutyrate very quickly. It's a great source of fuel and it makes you feel full. You feel like you just ate breakfast, you feel light, you feel focused because yes, there is a little caffeine and caffeine is stimulant. And coffee is one of nature's most powerful superfoods. You just can't be toxic. So there's more antioxidants in coffee than there is in green tea. So you mix it with the, wa with the yeah, coffee with the water right and then add have... this other stuff? Sorry, Dan, hang you on. You can with... make the, stuff oh. with the coffee with the water and then you add the butter and the coconut oil? Yeah, so you can do it however you want. I, I do a, um, a uh, French press and then I, I blend it. You blend it. Take a hand wand. It, it's like the tastiest latte you'll ever have. It's awesome. What'd you, what you? Yeah, decaf, um, yes, regular coffee. So, uh, I had an electrician who told me that the, the stuff they use to decaffeinate coffee is the same stuff they use to strip uh, pipes. So it's incredibly toxic. Yeah. 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 So anyway, that's just kind of a fun thing. It really helped me to overcome. Because I, my biggest fear, I'm addicted to sugar. Sugar is addicting. It's very addicting. By the end of the day, like I and and I I still cheat with some like my cheat my go to, oh man, is um, sweet potato chips, ha, oh, so good right? But they're I'm, they're baked up there with your vegetable oils and stuff, so it's it's not the best thing in the world. But um, and we'll get more into that and why that's so important, why to stay away from breads and stuff when we do our detox lecture. It's a really good lecture. Um, I just want to hit alcohol real quick. People always ask me about alcohol. What can, what, can, what can I do with alcohol? So the research is kind of mixed on this one. But the idea is, first of all, understand the, the principle. A gram of carbs has four calories. A gram of fat has nine calories. That was one of the reasons why I say, don't eat fat. It'll make you fat. It has more calories. Bogus, right? It has nothing to do with calories, everything to do with stimulating your hormones. Alcohol has seven calories. But the problem is it acts like a carb. So it, stim it spikes your insulin, it actually spikes your blood pressure too, and it increases the aging process, and of course it's a toxin, so it's rough on your liver and stuff like that. But we still want to drink alcohol. So what do we do? Well, this is my recommendation. 
because, you know, I'm a gaucho, and sometimes we like to have a glass of wine. UCSB, anybody? Yay. No? Okay. All right. <laughs> so this company I came across, and these guys are awesome. They're called Dry Farm Wines. And what my research, basically I've concluded that you got to get your least toxic uh, grape, and it's got to be the, um, like, organic, no pesticides, all that stuff. But these guys are full-on paleo, ketogenic, low-carb type of deal. They search the world for all these wines that don't have uh, any sulfites or lowest amount of sulfites, toxins, they're organic, and the lowest amount of sugar, which, of course, that means there's less alcohol, though, right? Because yeah. sugar is what <coughs> converts into the alcohol. But like an average glass of wine, I think, has like 14 um, as 14 percent theirs will be like around 12 percent but I can have a glass of wine and I can wake up and feel like a million bucks the next day uh, I'll have a glass of wine with my mom and she's got to get like her by the way all this stuff typically is not from the states because the states are all about processing it making it taste as good as possible unfortunately where they have much higher standards outside of the states so yes I hate to like push us away from our California wines but in my opinion, I brought one of these bottles to a wine tasting my mom put on, and everybody was going to judge the wines and see which one was the best tasting. Mine got last place. They taste terrible, like horrible. <laughs> they taste like dirt, you know, like and you can taste the soil. But I don't, it's nice to have a, it's like a, your healthy glass of wine. So they're a, um, a distributor. So you just go to dryfarmwines.com, that type of thing. Yeah, online. I just want to talk, this will take me two seconds. Supplements. So those of you know, I don't take a lot of supplements. I, I like to get my nourishment from whole foods. So multivitamin, yes, you should be taking one, but I take mine in, instead of from a bottle, well, it's still a bottle, but uh, from a synthetic you know, vitamin, I take it uh, in the form of chlorella. And chlorella is just blue-green algae, packed with nourishment, packed with antioxidants, packed with chlorophyll, packed with uh, pro even protein. So you gotta kinda count your protein when you consume this stuff. But there's your multivitamin, simple. And then here's your mineral intake, Celtic sea salt. Unrefined salt has over 80 minerals in it, and it's cheap. You don't have to buy a supplement. It works great. People now, they, what they do is they, never, they always put a pinch in their water. They might taste it. I, I do it, so I like salt. So, and salt is important. When you're a fat burner, you actually require more salt in your diet. Uh, vitamin D3, K2, that combo right there. If you're, take, if you're savvy enough to take vitamin D, also know that it should be in the form of D3 combined with K2. Otherwise, just D3 can cause some problems. And also, you need to still expose yourself to some sun to make those biochemical reactions actually uh, take place. Vitamin D is an important hormone involved in your immune system. One of the main reasons why people get so sick during the winter time, we don't have so much sun, right? Uh, and essential fatty acids. If you're going to say, oh, Dr. Bates is crazy, grass-fed, well, that's not even a real thing. Well, then at least supplement with your essential fatty acids from fish oil or krill oil, okay? Probiotics, I'm going to explain in the detox um, lecture why you're going to save a lot of money by not taking a probiotic supplement. Um, but just know if you've taken an antibiotic or if you've never taken a probiotic in your life, then yeah, maybe a month's worth of probiotics is a good thing. But in that lecture, we're going to learn why you don't need it ongoing. It can actually be a bad thing. Chlorella, chlorella, uh, C -A um, C H L O R E L L A. It's just like eating. Oh, um, so we would just send people to Mercola.com for that product, but um, yeah, I mean that's we found the best quality for the best price on Mercola. Is it a form of a vegetable? It's an algae, yeah. C H L O R R A. R E L L A. Yes. No, so I'll yeah. You just it's just like a pill. I'll t yeah yeah, but it's it's a pill. See, it's compressed pill here, but you'll take like no, nah, you don't want to mix it in your smoothie. Just get it down, get it down. Yeah, don't ruin your smoothie. So. Yes, yeah, that's like the Cadillac, the pink Cadillac. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said that the other day to my patient, and his, his father in law uh, 
owns Steve Thomas BMW, and he's like, come on, dude, the BMW. I was like, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Question? Yeah, it, no, but remember, we're actually eating a very small portion, like no more than, I'll have three eggs and then I'll have maybe three ounces of meat at night. So, it, yeah, and then you're eating all the, you know, your romaine and your broccoli. My broccoli, <laughs> you steam it because that's the best way to get the nutrients from broccoli, and then you mix it with a grass-fed butter, pour on some salt. Yeah. It's the best tasting broccoli ever. I mean, it tastes amazing. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, on the density scale, romaine is highest below kale. And I'm not going to eat a bunch of kale. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it'll say something different in another book. But yeah. So, <clears throat> okay. I just wanted, uh, just real quick on exercise because it's January and people kill themselves in the gym. But let me just say <clears throat> abs are made in the kitchen. If you want a six pack, you don't do it by doing sit ups all day, you do it by becoming a fat burner. That's how you get rid of it. That's how you get a six pack. Okay. So don't kill yourself. Exercise should be fun. Literally, I tell my wife, my workouts are designed simply to be able to maneuver and keep up and stay dynamic and injury resilient so I can keep up with my kids. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason for it. Yeah. I want them to be able to jump on me and me not injure myself and stuff like that. Yeah. It's about the kids. <laughs> So exercise for fun, injury resilience, which we teach injury resilience in this office, and enhanced performance, and an emotional release. Now, I work out seven days a week, an hour a day, but I only lift weights for a total of maybe 20 minutes a week. I only run for maybe a total of 20 minutes a week. The rest is playing with my kids, going on hikes, um, surfing, you know, all that type of fun stuff, and that's it, okay? It's made in the kitchen. So just to recap, H equals N over C. Minimize your carbs, count your carbs, and I'll show you how to do that in just a quick second. Right size your protein. Eat good fat to satiety. Fat will make, it's, it's the weirdest feeling. You eat all this fat and you feel like good, full, but you also feel like you could run a marathon. If I were to eat like a Jersey Mike sandwich and I get full, I don't feel, I feel like stuffed, and then I feel like I can't do anything for at least a couple hours, right? It's the weird, I'm not saying you eat a bunch of fat and then go run a marathon. That's not what I said. But I'm just saying you, you feel good. Fast with coffee. So minimize your window of eating, intermittent fasting, and supplement whole foods. That's actually pretty simple. It took a lot of explanation, but that's pretty simple. Are you allowed to drink coffee if you're under 18? That is a case-by-case -case question. <laughs> you should ask your dad. He knows the right answer. How long do the fasts last? So, yeah, you want to get like a minimum of 15 hours. Basically, just skip breakfast and have your, have your, um, your coffee. No. Okay. Yes, it's very important that you heard that right. Intermittent fasting means you're just, there's a window in every day that you're detoxing. And your energy and your weight, I mean, it's awesome. Well, be a good substitute. I'm sorry. sorry. Go ahead. Mary. When are you drinking coffee? When? When? Um, when I wake up. Yeah, you, you eat that's my breakfast. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what would be a good substitute? Don't... For coffee? coffee yeah. Do a tea or do water or do... But is caffeine kind of the idea there? Or... No. So remember, when you think caffeine, you think bad thing. Coffee is a superfood loaded with antioxidants. It stimulates your brain in a very focusing way when it's not chock full of toxins. So what I recommend, if you're anti-caffeine, like I was a year and a half ago, didn't touch this stuff. I worked at Starbucks for six months, became a caffeine addict, and then like I'd never again because it would just gave me anxiety. Well, then try good quality coffee or a good quality um, tea in the morning, like chamomile or something, totally caffeine free, but blend it up with your. I'm only avoiding it for the acidity. Again, you're do not worry about acidity with this diet. You're getting plenty of vegetables. It's balancing it out. Okay. So they advise you to be alkaline and acidic. Then just measure your pH. 
you monitor it. Don't go by don't go by generalizations. You're asking me a specific question, so measure yourself specifically. They have pH strips. Measure yourself. Yeah. How come you didn't mention water and everybody said drink lots of water? You know what the craziest thing is? When I, I was burning more fat, it's like you're you I was drinking less water and I felt great. Is the it's the strangest thing. I think it's because I was eating drinking a lot of coconut milk though as well. Yeah, which is so well, it's still yeah, and coconut milk. milk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's what you're gonna download. It's an app. It's like three dollars. Okay. Yes, it's an app that costs money, mm -hmm. but it's worth it. This really helped educate me to where you know people would ask me, oh, what about a cashew? How many? And I'm like, oh, a cashew has this many. You know, like you start memorizing it. In the first week that you kind of keep track of your carbs, it kind of takes a while because you enter stuff in and it, you know. But then in, you'd be surprised how predictable you are. <laughs> They putting in the you realize maybe you only eat three of the same meals all the time, so you but you modify it a little bit. It's really easy to um, uh, enter in and see how much carbs you got in a day, how many calories, how many PUFAs, how many um, long chain essential fatty acids. It's not savvy savvy enough to know that if you eat grass fed beef, you're going to get more long chain fatty acids. But this thing's pretty awesome. It's three dollars. So. So lastly, I know I, I'm thinking I might have left you with more questions on this one than answers. Um, but, uh, you know, this was a bit of an experiment. So what I can say is I just wanted to open your eyes to the idea of, one, nutrient-dense foods, and two, your ratio of macronutrients. Because that really does make a huge impact on uh, some of these changes like health, energy, weight loss. I mean, it will, it will kind of be that missing link that you never, you're like, why did somebody not know this before? And it's because there's all these misconceptions of saturated fat is clogging your arteries. It doesn't work that way. Okay, it has more to do with inflammation. And inflammation is created from what? Bad food. Bad food, yeah. We learned PUFAs, high omega-6s, and carbohydrate, right? So anyway, and now that you know this, you're going to kind of have to experiment on yourself. Hopefully we do these things that provide some inspiration to make some change, but ultimately long-term change comes from good routines. So hopefully you all have a, you know, just have fun. It's your journey. Like I said, you know, buy the pH strips or get the chronometer and just play with it. Have fun with it, but know these principles, okay? And I'll hang out for a couple of questions afterwards if somebody wants to get more detailed questions. But thank you for coming tonight and good luck. Good. All right. Hi, Dr. Aaron Bates here. And uh, for those of you that watched our nutrition lecture, uh, just give you an example of what we do. Today is um, uh, Thursday morning. It's 11 o'clock. I'm eating my first meal of the day. And I've got myself a nice little, it's kind of like a wedge salad loaded with romaine lettuce, a couple slices of bacon, um, about three quarters of an avocado, two eggs, a couple, a little bit of blue cheese crumbles, and a little bit of olive oil. And this thing will keep me full until uh, dinner time. So uh, just a quick little example of some food that you can try out. Um, enjoy.